Welcome back. During his recent visit to Hong Kong, former Governor Chris Patton met journalists at the Foreign Correspondents Club, students at the University of Hong Kong, and took part in a public forum on Hong Kong's governments. We caught up with him last Saturday. There are people who say that, for example, your visit here this, this week is unhelpful, that, you know, you've been governor of Hong Kong, you should just shut up, keep out of it now. What do you say to that? Well, I, I, I come back a lot less frequently than I'm invited. And I came back this time principally to speak at a seminar on good governance. And I come back because I'm obviously concerned about the treaty which underpins Hong Kong's status and freedoms, the Joint Declaration. Um, as I've said many times, it wasn't the Chinese Declaration, it was a treaty drawn up between Britain and China, and I had some part in trying to implement it before 1997, and I'm keen to see it implemented for as many of the 50 years after 1997 as are available to me. I don't imagine all of them will be, um, but because um, I'll be over 100 by 2047. But um, I'm keen to play my part in the international community in trying to check out what's actually happening here. But you are, if I may say so, one of the few people who actually talk about the Joint Declaration. I'm not talking about Beijing, I mean in the British government. I think it's almost a non-subject, particularly under the Cameron administration, which, which had a policy of getting as close to China as possible with no hint of criticism. Well, there's a report every six months or so on um, how things are going in Hong Kong, which is a result of the Joint Declaration. Um, and I think that what you're referring to um, in the Cameron uh, government was that spectacular misunderstanding which quite a lot of people have in other societies, that you can only do business with China um, if, first of all, you do the lowest, um, most head-banging kowtow possible and we both know that that's nonsense the, the declaration isn't the China declaration it's the Sino-British joint declaration and under it um, Britain had obligations to the people of, Ch of Hong Kong which it had to um, implement before 1997 and report progress to China through the joint liaison group and after 1997, China has commitments to the people of Hong Kong and Britain has, an, has a treaty um, interest in how those are discharged. Um, I notice that the that Chinese officials very rarely talk about the joint declaration, but it's there and it's a treaty lodged at the United Nations. And I don't think they want to be seen to be people who break their word. It's unclear how far the interpretation by the National People's Congress um, is actually an attempt to rewrite Hong Kong's laws. But I imagine that um, the next significant development will be the ruling of the appeal court. And then it may, I suppose, go to the court of final appeal. What I can't, couldn't really understand was why the NPC felt obliged to do it. The issue was being handled by the Hong Kong courts. I think it's an issue which Hong Kong people can um, manage and look after themselves. I think breaches of the joint declaration, like for example the abduction of those uh, publishers in Hong Kong, it was taken up by not only um, the British government but by uh, other governments around the world. And I think it was a cause of huge embarrassment to China. Um, I wondered at what level the decision to make that abduction was made. Um, I mean, none of us knows, but 
um, I think it might have been um, excessive enthusiasm by some uh, secret police or equivalent. And just before we get off the, the whole area of, of foreign intervention, if you like, in Hong Kong affairs, the, the Chief Secretary of Hong Kong has been saying for the last two years that he has irrefutable evidence that foreign forces were behind the Occupy movement. Uh, he hasn't produced it as of yet. But, I mean, do you, do you actually think there are foreign forces who, who, who would be interested in intervention in Hong Kong affairs? Why? I mean, no, I certainly don't. Maybe fairies or gnomes or people who come down the chimney with Christmas presents. Maybe they're active. Um, but I don't think there are malign foreign forces skulking around in the shrubbery um, to uh, do Hong Kong damage. I think that's um, absurd. I think it's perhaps understandable that frustration at the lack of progress has encouraged some to go further and argue for um, independence, whatever that means. And I don't think that's sensible. Um, and I think it risks losing the moral high ground, which um, those, uh, on the whole, young democracy activists had gained. And I think it risks um, splintering their support um, because an awful lot of people who are actively supporting their arguments about democracy will regard what they say about independence as a delusion. Um, I observe in passing um, that nobody's ever made any money betting against Hong Kong. Um, and Hong Kong usually comes out on the right side of the argument and certainly on the right side of uh, history. So um, I think that sort of underpins my optimism about Hong Kong. I think, by and large, my belief that freedom usually wins the day and that democracy usually comes out on top. I think uh, history is on the side of that. Technological development is on the side of that. So I think democracy will outgun, will outlive um, authoritarianism. You're making this statement in a year in which Donald Trump I know. has become president, I know. in which there's crackdowns in the democratic system in Turkey, in Russia, yeah, there's in right, which anti-democratic forces are gaining Putin, ground all over Europe. There's Putin, there's Erdogan, there's Orban. Um, sure, but I still think that um, uh, freedom will win out at the end that of the day. That doesn't way. shake your confidence. Well, what it does for me is to um, underline two or three things. First of all, the importance of not allowing social media and the internet to uh, undermine the pursuit of truth in journalism and elsewhere in life, because I think that's really important. And it doesn't um, undermine my feeling that one of the reasons why um, we've got into t difficulties with people like Mr. Putin, um, one of the reasons why Donald Trump won the election in America, is that um, people with a more liberal view of the world didn't fight hard enough for what they believe in. Uh, I, I do think that we... Um, that what's happened this year should be a wake-up call, to use a cliché. Um, it's certainly the case in, in um, Britain with the so-called Brexit. Um, for years we allowed a view of Europe to take root, which bore no real relation to the reality, because people were fearful of arguing with tabloid editors and taking on rank prejudice. Uh, and I think that's been a rather salutary lesson to us all. 
I'm not going to, I mean, I don't think I'm thought to be generally somebody who holds his tongue. Um, but I'm even more determined to speak out now because of some of the things I've seen happening in the world which I think are potentially awful. Lord Patton, thank you very much thank indeed. Thank you very much indeed. Well, that's it from us for this week. We'll leave you with images of Cuba's former president,